And that confirms what we know from other sources, that the Kemalists invested all their energies in the creation of a brave new world, divorced in a sense from the realities of the old. The old town centers were neglected, and the ruins of the war years were still very visible uh, 20 years later. Uh, the town center of Kayseri, or for instance the center of Izmir, which had been completely destroyed by a great fire in 1922, they are still empty in 1937-38, 15 years later. Villages were left to their own devices, except for the villages that were close to provincial towns. These were subjected, subjected to the experience of visits by the so-called village sections of the people's houses. And the people's houses were the cultural centers of the ruling party in all the provincial towns. Now these cultural, these cultural centers, these people's houses, had sections that were supposed to occupy themselves with the villages. And these visit, visits by these people to the villages have been described very effectively by Jedet Kudret in his semi-autobiographical novel, Havadabuvudjok, and there's no, no cloud in the sky. Uh, what happened was that during these visits, the villages were registered, inspected, you know, bodily, also their teeth, um, lectured to on issues like modernity, hygiene, the nation, and national pride. Um, but in La Turquie, Kemalist, these activities by the people's houses are highlighted uh, as a key to the efforts of the state and the party to develop the countryside. Now, and this, in a sense, shows you the distance, almost, between and the Kemalist regime and everyday reality. The pictures in the journal, whether of villages or of towns, never show crowds. Except for one thing, and the disciplined mass of young people giving gymnastic displays in the new stadium of Ankara. And that highlights another element in the modernity that was so valued by the Kemalists. And the Kemalists were not only followers of uh, positivism, and they were also, by and large, people with a military background. They were former generals and colonels. And both these influences um, gave them a great um, bias towards order, the concept, the concept of order. It's very important in positivism because uh, and the, the, the positivist uh, slogan is ordre et progrès, order and progress, <coughs> still inscribed in the flag of Brazil, by the way. Um, and that was the slogan of the positivist. They believe in order based on science. And so, Positivism is not a revolutionary ideology. It is, uh, in that sense, a counter-revolutionary ideology. And positivists prefer order, orderly change. Now, I don't have to explain to you that military men also have a strong preference for order. It's what they learn from their days in school and always practice. And so, Kabbalists, uh, attach great importance uh, to order. The only crowds we see are orderly crowds, disciplined masses. I would argue that uh, all of this, and especially the absence of real people and everyday life in this journal of uh, the Kemalist regime, is, is very significant. We'll come back to The modernity displayed in La Turquie Kemaliste 
certainly is not all about industrialization, about uh, progressive villages and agricultural improvements or building projects. It's also culture. The pictures and articles also show us the favorite pastimes of the urban elite of the Republic, which clearly mimics those of the bourgeoisie in contemporary Europe. We see them busy at sports such as tennis, uh, hunting, horse riding, busy ball ballroom dancing, visiting the theater, visiting exhibitions, and taking the waters at spas. The message conveyed in these pages to the European audience, and remember this was addressing a European audience, clearly is not radical. It's not revolutionary. And the leading strata of the Republic are not depicted in heroic revolutionary poses, um, but and the image conveyed is one that must have meant to give the Europeans a feeling that these Turks are just like us. You know, the Westerners, just like us. Well, that, of course, is a, is a theme that has dominated uh, very much in Turkish communications with the West. The ideal country depicted in the pages of that Turkey Kemalist of course, had an idealized population as well. The journal wants to present a picture of the new Turk, and it does so primarily, but not exclusively, in a series called Le Visage Turc, the Turkish face. This consists of posed portraits of people from different walks of life. Um, and their common factor is that their facial expressions, without exception, express optimism, happiness, willpower, and determination. These are the ideal Turks. Special attention is paid to the young and to women. Okay. More ideal Turks. A modern Turkish woman in very contemporary dress, as you can see. And a very famous young Turkish woman, Sabiha Gökçen, Turkish female pilot, first Turkish female pilot, adopted daughter of Ataturk. Um, the vigor and enthusiasm of its young population is shown as one of Turkey's greatest assets. And then as now, and women, the public appearance of women, and the role of women in the public sphere is seen as a yardstick of modernity. That's true, of course, not still true in Turkey today, uh, both for secularists and different groups of Islamists, that the public appearance and the public role of women really is the yardstick of modernity or decency for the other side. This emphasis on the young, I would like to point out, is quite revolutionary in itself in Turkey. That is very recent. It was only the young Turks after 1908 who started to promote the idea that being young was a good thing, that entitled you to authority, and that because you were young and energetic, you uh, understood the future better than the old generations. That is a revolutionary concept in Ottoman society and in Turkish society, because that had always privileged age Age was the passport to authority. The, the older, the wiser. And um, <coughs> the whole idea that a younger generation knows better because it is younger, more in tune with the world, more in tune with what is happening and having a better understanding of the future, that in itself 
is quite revolutionary and we do not always realize that nowadays because it has become so normal for us. So, what can a careful reading of and, and gazing at La Turquie Kemalist teach us about the Kemalist's ideal of modernity? Now, first of all, while Kemalism is an idealist movement, Kemal's modernity does not seem to be a utopian ideal. The examples highlighted uh, in the 49 issues uh, over 14 years, the ones that I've shown you, show an idealized modern society with a healthy and well-educated urban elite, urban citizens living in light and airy houses, built along straight new streets that are the result of rational and scientific town planning. It shows a countryside inhabited by innovating pioneers, but there is no attempt to engage in either socio-economic or cultural experiments. Quite the contrary, it's very visibly an attempt to transplant contemporary European modernity to Anatolia. Not just in terms of trains and factories, but also in that of and the favorite outdoors and indoors pastimes of the European bourgeoisie. Hunting, horse riding, skiing, playing tennis, going to the theater, dancing. In this sense, Kamal's modernity is very literally contemporary. It's not futuristic, and it's, in that sense, Asri, later Chardash, seems to be a very adequate term to describe it. As a Turk was neither Stalin nor Gandhi. And his vision, even if it can be described as radical for the Turkey of the 30s, did not reach beyond contemporary European bourgeois modernity. In other words, what the Kemalists try to construct is not a novel society, but a modern European one. This makes Kemalist modernity a flexible concept. It essentially means being part of contemporary civilization at its most advanced level, be it in the 30s, 50s, or even now. As Ilhan Tekeli has pointed out, the desire to appropriate the distinctive characteristics of the most advanced or civilized countries in the contemporary world has injected a dynamism, an optimism, and a forward-looking mentality in the generations that grew up in the 1930s and 40s, and they were inspired by the Kemalist program. That is perhaps the most important legacy of Kemalism. And this point is perhaps also overlooked by those groups in Turkey who understand themselves to be a true Kemalists and keepers of Ataturk legacy um, when they look for solutions in the very specific and time-bound version of modernity that the Kemalists constructed in the 1930s, 40s. These modern-day Kemalists uh, seem to deplay, display something that um, Özgürek, in a very apposite uh, phrase, has called the nostalgia for the modern. And that is very prevalent in some circles in Turkey today. A nostalgia for the modern for that very specific modern that we've seen here today, that modernity of the early republic. And while these Kemalist currents use the term contemporary, Chardash, to differentiate the position from that of uh, currents that in their eyes threaten to turn back the clock in Turkey by undermining secular democracy, things like women's rights, in doing so, they take a view of modernity formulated over 80 years ago as their benchmark <coughs> and risk, therefore, Tur turning Turkey of the 30s into something uh, for them which is akin to the Asri Saadet of the Islamists, huh? the idea of an ideal society under and immediately after the Prophet Muhammad. In a sense, <coughs> at the 1930s and 40s have become the Kemalist Asri Saadet, the age of felicity. But 
If a flexible and dynamic interpretation of modernity is the strength of Kemalism, La Turquie Kemaliste also clearly shows up the weaknesses of the Kemalist modernization project. The almost total absence of scenes from daily life in the pictures and in the texts is highly significant. It shows that for the Kemalists, Anatolia was a tabula rasa, was a blank page in a sense, an empty canvas on which they could draw their own vision of the future. It allowed them to conceptualize the work they were engaged in as a heroic modernization leap in which they built a society that was on a par with European civilization and not as a step-by-step -step improvement of the existing condition. And that is where these uh, urban developments are so, so, so clearly significant. And this, the fact that they left old town centers largely in ruins but at the same time built new towns uh, very often along the, the road to the railway station and with parks and cafes and cinemas and modern apartment blocks uh, in a new Turkey. That shows you that mentality. The complete absence of crowds in the pictures is no coincidence either. And the Kemalists uh, brought up with um, very um, uh, right-wing ideas on mass psychology, which they had derived from uh, Gustave Le Bon, the inventor of crowd psychology in late 19th century France. Um, they, um, they had a strong dislike of what they saw as the irrational behavior of the uncontrolled masses. Le Bon, um, becomes extremely popular in the late 19th, early 20th century uh, among the right and also in the different uh, armies of Europe um, with his ideas on crowd control and the essential irrationality and danger of the mob that needs to be controlled. And this is an idea, Le Bon has been an inspiration to uh, Benito Mussolini, uh, but also to the Kabbalists. Masses need to be strictly controlled. And as indeed they are, of course, during the gymnastics displays in the stadium or the Boy Scout <coughs> parades that we see in other uh, Kabbalist publications. And this trust of the masses, of course, has remained a prominent uh, and 